And hello again. Uh, this is part two of uh, my testimony to the uh, Fish uh, Correction, the uh, House Fish, Wildlife, and Water Resources Committee in regards to uh, H375, a bill that seeks to uh, promote and incentivize the use of ecological toilets and rainwater systems in Vermont. So I'll just jump right in. This uh, second part is referred to as, or was what I'm calling, uh, the opportunity in front of us. We'll start out uh, with this uh, this overview um, with first with some definitions. Um, there's a couple of them. I've used the uh, term sustainable sanitation uh, earlier in the presentation, but I never defined it. So let's go ahead and do that now. Uh, as you can see, both sustainable and, eco and ecological sanitation are Rather similar. Um, the main difference between the two is that while ecological sanitation is always uh, concerned with the reuse of human excreta, um, and I might point out a funny side here, and that is apparently the, uh, the legislation we're proposing uh, with H that H375 will be the first time that the um, term human excreta has ever been um, uh, find in uh, a piece of legislation in Vermont. So funny aside. Anyways, uh, ecological sanitation always uh, in, uh, concerned with the reuse of human excreta. Sustainable sanitation not always uh, concerned with that. More concerned uh, with the sustainability. Uh, obviously, if reuse, if a, if a reuse scheme used in conjunction, then it's even more sustainable. Um, but there are occasions where, uh, for various reasons, uh, reuse is not is not undertaken. And I'll get into that more uh, when I provide you some international examples, some sustainable sanitation initiatives that um, in my in part three of this uh, presentation. Um, so you'll hear more about that in a moment. But let's just read them aloud. Ecological sanitation, otherwise known as ECOSAN, is based on three fundamental principles, preventing pollution rather than attempting to control it, rendering urine and feces safe for reuse, and using the safe products for agricultural purposes. Uh, sustainable sanitation uh, is a term that was de uh, first defined by members of the International Sustainable Sanitation Alliance. Um, to be sustainable, uh, a sanitation system should meet the following five criteria. This is just a should, not a must. Uh, should be economically viable, socially acceptable, technically and institutionally appropriate, and protective of the environment and the natural resources. A couple more uh, uh, definitions, ecological toilet. Um, it's an umbrella term that we've borrowed from uh, folks that are working on similar issues in Cape Cod, uh, particularly the, uh, the Cape Cod Ecological Toilet Center. Um, we're using it to refer to composting toilets, urine diverting dry toilets, or any other toilet that uses a minimum amount of water or no water at all, and which is designed primarily to prevent pollution and render urine and feces safe for reuse. Human excreta, we've already talked about, that is obviously human feces and urine. So, moving ahead, opportunity in front of us. Uh, the opportunity in front of us is, is uh, unsustainable, or correction, is sustainable sanitation and reuse, and in particular, ecological toilets. Uh, so what is an eco-toilet? For the purposes of this bill, we have chosen to borrow the general phrase, ecological toilet, describe waterless or almost waterless toilets that are designed primarily to recycle human excreta, thereby closing the, new, the natural cycle that we've neg neglected for far too long. And as I've already described, we first came across this term when reading about an innovative pilot project that's underway in nearby Cape Cod. Uh, you will hear a first-hand account of this uh, innovative uh, pilot project later in another presentation. Ecological toilets differ from the toilets that most of us are likely most familiar with, commonly known as flush toilets. Uh, which rely on water and are designed around the concept of human feces and urine being waste materials that need to be disposed of. And while not always utilized in conjunction with a reuse scheme, ecological toilets do, by design, permit and facilitate in a very safe and efficient manner the reuse of human excreta. Back to this in a moment. The specific ecological toilets that this bill seeks to promote are the following composting toilets and urine diverting dehydration toilets. Uh, the bill also includes currently um, uh, two other types of toilets. Uh, we would advocate that probably the concept of a lined pit latrine, even though it's an improvement uh, over a septic system, 
um, in that the only thing that's going in there are uh, feces, urine, and rubber materials, toilet paper. Um, that uh, we wonder whether this bill should ultimately include those. Makes sense in some cases, others it may not, but moving forward, we'll uh, like to have, you know, be part of that discussion. Uh, but before I, before I continue, please allow me two brief caveats. First, please keep in mind that the end goal of a composting toilet is compost, aka humus. Well, the end goal goals, and that's plural, of a urine diverting dehydration toilet are liquid urine and desiccated, aka dried feces. In the case of the former, the composting process is what, at least in theory, but not always in practice, eliminates human pathogens. And in the case of the latter, Time is what sterilizes urine, although urine is usually sterile anyways, while the prolonged and profound absence of moisture is what, at least in theory, but not always in practice, eliminates human pathogens. Second, and on a directly related note, we should never forget that just like sanitation systems that are based on eco-toilets, our legacy sanitation systems are not 100% effective at eliminating human pathogens. It's a funny uh, thing that occurs when, when the discussion turns to Ecological toilets and ecological sanitation, the major topic, your focus becomes these systems uh, eliminate pathogens. Meanwhile, when someone talks about a wastewater treatment system involving a wastewater treatment plant or septic systems, there's rarely ever any discussion uh, about just assume that they do, that they're always 100% effective, when in reality, uh, that's not the case. Um, both systems um, have uh, their drawbacks and and both systems uh, exist in reality. And, and in the reality is that probably there's no system out there short of something that maybe exists on the space shuttle uh, that that can be 100% effective 100% of the time. So it's not really the, I don't really feel like it's a point uh, to ponder as long as certain internationally recognized uh, procedures are, are, are utilized uh, to minimize the threat to individuals and to uh, society. Uh, we're, we're fine, I guess, is the point I'm trying to make. So to continue, um, in each instance, we rely on separate and distinct, what we can call multiple barrier approaches to minimize the risk to the public. Uh, I won't go into them here, but suffice it to say that as long as certain uh, universally accepted precautions are taken, both systems are equally effective at providing, actually preventing human exposure to harmful pathogens. So repeating what I just said. Composting toilet. I want to point out right off the uh, top here that com the term composting toilet is in some ways a misnomer. It can be a misnomer, given that the finished composting process may or may not occur in the toilet itself, but may, depending on design and frequency of use and uh, the requirements of end use, uh, require a separate treatment step, which is uh, generally longer term and or higher temperature composting in an outdoor compost pile. However, this hasn't stopped the term composting toilet from enjoying widespread use, and so it's the term that we'll make, a, make use of as well. So generally speaking, what is a composting toilet? Well, a composting toilet is a type of dry or almost dry toilet that uses a predominantly aerobic cross-site treatment of human excreta by composting or a managed aerobic decomposition. Uh, this uh, article I've uh, modified slightly, uh, but the original uh, comes from the associated Wikipedia article. Um, I normally don't cite Wikipedia articles, but in this case, um, I know the information to be valid and trusted because I happen to know personally the identities of the authors involved and can vouch for their um, expert international credentials. They're, they're uh, all experts in the field of sustainable sanitation internationally. Here you can see uh, three images of a wheelbarrow showing you the, uh, the end product of a composting toilet. Um, be hard pressed to, to identify any difference between it and the, and, uh, the finished product of a, of a backyard composting pile that people use for vegetable waste and, and um, yard waste. Um, incredibly nutrient rich, uh, safe to handle uh, material with many uses. All right, uh, some common or features common to all composting toilets are a toilet seat. See, obviously, all these all these toilets have a toilet seat, um, at least in Western style designs. I should I should point out a, cha a chamber or removable container where excreta is deposited 
and a structure of some kind that conceals the chamber or container from view. You can see all these toilets pretty much meet that, uh, that uh, definition. And uh, the exception here, um, the second image from the bottom, from the left in the bottom row, uh, shows a gentleman standing in front of a large uh, structure. That's actually the business end of what we're going to get to in a minute, which I'm referring to as, a, as remote composting toilets. Um, the toilet that uh, would look more like the toilets that you see in the upper row that would be uh, located on a floor above where this gentleman is. Uh, this would just be the working end of the toilet. Much larger, um, larger capacity, uh, more robust systems. All right. Uh, other features may include uh, a passive using chim uh, utilizing a chimney effect or an active utilizing an electrically powered fan ventilation system electric element to heat the contents of the chamber or the container uh, and to assist with evaporating liquids. In addition, chamber of red wriggler worms, vermicomposting, uh, which uh, images on the slide, the bottom far right image is of a, is referred to as a moldering toilet that's in use uh, on the trail networks, both in Vermont, New Hampshire, and, and around the country and apparently around the world. Um, brought to you by the Green Mountain Club. I'll talk about them in a moment. Uh, and some allowance for stirring or turning the contents of the chamber or container to promote aeration. Looking back in time, this kind of toilet and or the sanitation uh, principles it relies upon, go forward to this image. Basically the concept of composting. Um, uh, in use for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, there's ample evidence actually that early Amazonian peoples blossomed in the harsh rainforest environment by mixing their excrement with ash and other organic materials to create what's referred to in Portuguese as terra preta, black earth, otherwise known as incredibly rich and fertile soil. Um, although it runs somewhat contrary to the perception of rainforest as lands of plenty, they are actually in, uh, in actuality a very difficult place to live uh, if you're a non-nomadic human. In other words, uh, a human that relies on agriculture for survival. Um, there's actually examples uh, where this terra preta earth has been found where the soil is 10 or 15 feet deep and it is the richest, most beautiful soil you can ever imagine, which stands out in stark contrast to the soil, the rest of the soils in the rainforest environment, which are incredibly uh, weak. Um, all of the nutrients pretty much in a rainforest uh, exists in the flora that you see. See, whereas the soils are, are, uh, are not rich at all. So this ingenious method, uh, composting, thereby allowed fairly substantial populations to exist where they wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And uh, you know, currently in the Amazonian rainforest, there's very just small populations, uh, small pockets of populations where back, back you know, a um, thousand or more years ago, Back in the time of the conquistadors, uh, you know, more recently, in the time of the conquistadors, uh, there were apparently massive populations living in the rainforest, and uh, the co the concept of composting made that made that possible. Leading up to the advent of the flush toilet, and even following its creation, people in various parts of the world uh, relied on earth closets, uh, what we in Eng at least in English call earth closets, which is the predecessor term I might point out to water closets which were nothing more than a simple storage box uh, designed for the temporary storage of excreta, wiping materials, and what's presently termed bulking agents or cover materials, which are typically brown uh, carbon-rich materials like sawdust, dried leaves, coconut core, even soil itself, which uh, was sprinkled over each deposit to reduce odors and to improve the experience for the next toilet user. Anybody that has a backyard composting uh, system is familiar with this concept. Uh, these toilets were either emptied by their owners into outdoor refuse piles, where, along with other organic refuse, uh, everything was presumably allowed to uh, decompose naturally, or collected by the night soil entrepreneurs of the day, who marketed this material to area farmers as nutrient-rich fertilizer or transported it away from the settlement uh, or settlements, um, basically to the edge of town, where it was simply dumped. In fact, the sanitation method was still in use in Japan up until a few decades ago, and is still practiced in parts of rural China, India, and elsewhere. Plus, there's an entire development model that's been operating in the majority world, uh, what most pejoratively call the developing world, 
For the last few decades, it has made tremendous inroads into reviving this technology for use by the world's economically, politically, and geographically disenfranchised, obviously with the caveat that it's focused on the uh, on the composting process as opposed to just the night soil concept, um, which was uh, uncom uncomposted or uh, untreated materials. I'll, again, I'll give you some international examples a bit later. Fast forwarding to the here and now, and modern composting toilets tend to fall into one of two major categories. Those that are remote, I'll contain, here's an image of a, talk about it as I work through this section. Remote compost, uh, composting toilets, in a way, lightly resemble flush toilets in that they consist of three distinct and separate parts, a toilet, some sort of conveyance, and a remote treatment facility. However, in the case of a remote composting toilet, these three parts are typically housed in the same structure rather than being set some distance away from each other, as in systems that utilize a septic tank or a centralized wastewater treatment facility. The toilet typically, at least in the West, uh, resembles a conventional flush toilet in appearance only and can be constru constructed from plastic, fiberglass, porcelain, wood, masonry cement, uh, or the equivalent. And in the place of wastewater pipes, most composting toilets make use of a chute, a conveyor belt, or in some cases, uh, a vacuum system, all of which lead to a nearby composting chamber. These systems are generally designed so that the entire composting process takes place within the unit itself, although a secondary treatment step, generally again an outdoor compost pile, may be warranted depending on the uh, process utilized and the end use of the materials in question. So uh, referring here to, to the, uh, the slide, uh, here's the back up a minute. Uh, this is the this uh, gray line you see that runs across the upper third of the slide. That's uh, representing a floor. This structure here is a crude image of a pedestal toilet. That would be the toilet itself. This is the conveyance, which in this case is just a chute leading into a human center, which in this case is a composting uh, container. These tend to be quite large. Uh, they even sometimes utilize a, a carousel system whereby you'll have multiple containers that are on a, a round, like Lazy Susan kind of uh, contraption. And you, when one container fills up, you simply turn, rotate the uh, system to a fresh container. And they're designed to, those are typically designed so that uh, by the time you get around to the, uh, to the and that was originally filled up, um, that material is uh, is composted. Uh, so as you can see, the material goes uh, through the toilet, down through the chute, into the composting uh, container. Here, uh, as the composting process uh, occurs and as the liquids are evaporated out, out um, organically, the, mater the material becomes finer. And as the fines uh, work their way down, thanks to gravity through um, through the pile, they are uh, sieved out until they become basically the, the lowest layer, and uh, that's the finished layer, which is accessed here, as you can see, through this with withdrawal door. Um, lots of aeration systems. Uh, you're trying to prevent anaerobic conditions. You want aerobic conditions. You want anaerobic uh, Processes typically are very smelly, so you're, you're, you're doing what you can to prevent that. Uh, and systems like this, uh, large-scale uh, remote systems, are, are pretty adequate at doing just that. Um, they're far more capable than perhaps some of the systems I'm going to talk about uh, here in a moment. At least far more capable of, of uh, creating aerobic conditions within the toilet uh, structure itself. Here you can see uh, any liquids that are not evaporated out of the system um, are drained away. Um, that can be uh, that drainage system can lead to a simple French drain uh, system, uh, which we typically in, in this industry call a, a, a soakway or a drainway. Um, that's subgrade. In most cases, is is not a problem or it doesn't produce a, a problem, uh, or it can be. Uh, it can lead to a container which uh, the, the contents of can be um, disposed of conventionally in a dump or um, provided to a septage hauler uh, or um, taken directly to uh, a participating wastewater treatment facility. 
You'll also see here uh, the ventilation system. In this case, it's a mechanical system, uh, utilizes a fan. Beauty of uh, all ecological, well, not all ecological toilets, but certainly those that are system, um, is that uh, because they have uh, ventilation, uh, the ventilation which of which is, des is designed to pull air from the bathroom environment down through the toil, toilet, uh, through the composting chamber, and then up and out of the house, either out of a wall or up right through the roof of the house. Um, that creates a uh, basically a partial vacuum within the composting chamber, the toilet itself, um, and uh, equates to the back, uh, odor that people experience that, that utilize these toilets. Um, you know, a conventional flush toilet isn't venting constantly, uh, so you'll get smells associated with using a, a conventional flush toilet, whereas these systems, uh, assuming they're operating properly, you really don't get any odor. Uh, another benefit, uh, particularly in, well, really in any house, but certainly the more uh, newer energy efficient homes that require full-time ventilation in order to, to, uh, to uh, allow for air exchanges within the home, improve indoor air quality. Um, the system is working 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So it's it's constantly pulling air from the house and, and venting it outdoors. So a very handy feature for any home. All right, that covers, uh, covers this slide. All right, self-contained toilets. Let's go back to this image. Uh, self-contained uh, toilet uh, is, is Displayed um, in that bottom left-hand uh, slide on Mar version, um, and also the toilet that has the brown toilet seat. That's two images over to the right from that, and even uh, if you will, the the uh, image on the far right. Although that's not something you could pick up and move, it couldn't be really portable. Um, it could could be defined either way, I guess you could say. Um, Good examples of uh, what we're going to, refer to talk about now, which are self-contained toilets. In contrast, self-contained uh, units combine all these three parts that I described above into one compact unit, whereas remote toilets are typically intended for installation, like permanent installation in homes and businesses, and are somewhat more complicated, particularly as a result of the need for existing buildings, extensive retrofitting, and in both existing and new construction, basement or adequate crawl space located immediately underneath, or in the case of a vacuum system, uh, adjacent to the location of the toilet, self-contained composting toilets can be installed almost anywhere, needing at most uh, some connection to uh, ventilation ductwork and a drain for excess liquids, which as I described is normally directed to a subgrade soakway. And in some cases an electrical power source if the ventilation system utilizes a mechanical uh, fan, electrically powered fan. However, at their simplest, uh, like those self-contained versions which rely solely on an outdoor compost pile, and the best example uh, on this slide of a system like that is the, the, uh, the toilet that has the brown toilet seat and toilet, brown toilet lid. Uh, that would be more of a humanure style toilet, um, and that is uh, the contents are taken out regularly, tied to an exterior compost pile or actually a set of piles. Where they're allowed to, uh, you know, mixed with, with other organic matter, even food scraps, etc., and allowed uh, for the composting process to occur there. This is more of a uh, short term temporary storage where you actually go to the bathroom and then the process occurs outdoors. Uh, so, in those systems, none of these more complex systems are required, and the toilet itself can be placed literally anywhere a toilet is needed or desired, which make, brings me to an important point. Although it's impossible to know the numbers involved, uh, given their particularly, uh, particular ease of installation, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence available that people are making use of self-contained composting toilets and are doing so uh, right under the radar of our local code enforcement authorities, health departments, etc. And so one of the goals of this legislation uh, that we think should be included is to uh, create include uh, a user-friendly framework that will produce an environment conducive to allowing these users to emerge from the shadows. I want to support these folks and the commitment they've made toward improving the world around them, um, while also ensuring that not only will others feel comfortable following their lead, but that best practices are followed in order that these systems are operated in a safe and non-environmental and destructive manner. And if I may uh, editorialize uh, from a, a bit longer, something we hope is covered in the final version of the, of the bill as well is some sort of protection for consumers in relation to certain designs of self-contained composting toilets. 
Uh, any quick web search will produce ample negative consumer reviews of uh, certain self-contained composting toilets, some of which can be purchased right now at nearby building supply stores. The problem, it seems, is that uh, certain designs that were never meant for full-time use, uh, but instead for seasonal or only very occasional use, like at backcountry cottages or summer camps, et cetera, uh, have been placed in service uh, with, the, with the intent of full-time use, something that in practice causes a host of problems, not the least of which are very negative consumer attitudes towards these toilets. The cause, at least as far as we've been able to determine, uh, can be isolated to vague and unrealistic marketing claims made by manufacturers uh, and retailers um, and the lack of real-world standards. And I'll make a point here to point out that uh, actually uh, the toilets are, at least the, the Sun Marver is a good example, uh, the bottom left-hand corner of the bottom row. Uh, that, you know, that, Toilets that are, the majority of composting toilets sold in the United States right now, um, certainly from the large manufacturers, the large, you know, well-known and established manufacturers, uh, meet um, the uh, NSF 41 standard, which is something that several states have uh, written into their composting toilet or ecological toilet legislation, where they, they require people to use only toilets that have NSF 41 certification. Um, we would argue and urge uh, this legislation not attacked for several reasons. Um, number one, uh, NSF certification of any kind is very expensive to attain and very expensive to maintain. So newer manufacturers and certainly DIY um, people building their own, uh, something they cannot afford to uh, take part in. So uh, we, would re we would be restricting folks from utilizing any of the newer toilet designs, um, very effective and even in some cases more effective um, than, than the older designs. Um, we'd be restricting people from using those. We'd also be restricting people from building their own. Uh, and, uh, you know, taken together, uh, that's limiting. It also potentially limits uh, innovation and you know, utilize new technologies that stifles new technologies the creation of new technologies, and we end up um, sort of going along the same road that we've been on for the last, you know, number of decades, these technologies. So um, what, we, what we would argue uh, as a way to, uh, to accomplish many of the same goals is to include a performance standard. Uh, a lot of legislation includes prescriptive standards. We think a performance approach, performance-based approach is the way to go. Uh, the, the state of Arizona, uh, performance-based legislation that we're looking at. Um, basically, the performance standard would work to pair expectant users together with systems that are adequate and appropriate for their needs. Basically, we, would, we wouldn't advocate, or the, the legislation, at least as we would like to see it, wouldn't advocate certain technologies by the performance standard, and people would just have to meet that standard. And as long as they met that standard, wouldn't care, or the state wouldn't care what their toilets looked like, how they operated, blah, 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 blah. Just meet the standard and you're good to go. I think that's far more uh, far more freeing both to manufacturers and to users. All right, moving along. Urine diverting dehydration toilets. A more recent development uh, in the ecological toilet arena is what most referring to as the urine diverting dehydration toilet, uh, which is also, by the way, known as a urine diverting desiccation toilet or a urine diverting dry toilet. With users in Vietnam back in the 1980s now credited with the basic design, the concept is brilliantly simple. By utilizing a special bowl that is designed to separate urine and feces at the source and store each in, se in a segregated fashion, most of the operational challenges inherent with composting toilets are eliminated. Of course, one of the biggest challenges uh, is odor uh, in a composting toilet. And this gets back to uh, what I was referring to, with particularly where people are utilizing Toilets not designed for full-time use uh, as their full-time toilets. If odor is ever associated with a composting toilet, and this can quickly become an issue if certain basic and universal practices are not adhered to, it is the joint result of what happens when urine and feces are allowed to mix and a factor of the amount of oxygen or lack thereof and liquids present in the combined storage container. Anyone who's ever used a porta potty or what many think of as an outhouse uh, knows what I'm referring to. A noxious smell that's produced by the combination of hydrogen sulfide mostly by hydrogen sulfide and ammonia. Well, uh, with a urine diversion dehydration toilet, assuming it's used properly, odor is not simply not a problem. 
Um, and you know, before I said you can get online and, and find uh, numerous examples of people's people having issues with composting toilets. Uh, I think you'll be hard pressed. I certainly have been unable to uh, to find any any negative reviews of a, of a urine diverting dehydration toilet. Um, uh, you know, online uh, again, using assuming they're used properly, um, and that everyone that, that uses them understands their their uh, you know their, their purpose. Uh, these things simply do not smell. Uh, they're used aboard RVs, uh, aboard boats. Um, tiny houses and in residential and commercial uh, settings. And one sort of common thread that you'll find from reading people's reviews of these toilets is they just don't smell. And even if you do ever catch a whiff, it's typically just uh, smells like peat moss or, you know, soil. All right. Um, and you can just see in this image, you can see how there's kind of an odd shaped bowl in there in that in the toilet that's uh, that's being displayed. Um, Talk more about that in a moment. All right, um, and neither uh, another problem that's common in compo or can be common in composting toilets, which is not a, com a problem in a urine diversion diversion toilet properly, uh, is the aforementioned um, is the uh, unpleasant uh, to put it mildly slurry that can result from a poorly designed or misused composting toilet. Again, this is usually when people are using uh, part-time toilets in a full-time manner. Uh, the toilet can't get rid of, you can't rid the composting chamber of the excess liquids and you end up with this uh, really disgusting slurry, which is a nightmare to, to care for. Because a composting toilet uh, or a urine diversion toilet separates those two things, you just don't have that problem. Um, although, a, uh, although the urine storage container of a urine diversion toilet can and does smell if a there's no integral odor trap built into the urine drain or adequate ventilation built into the system uh, or if the container is not emptied on schedule um, however the feces chamber as i've already discussed uh, only imparts the smell of damp soil smell anything even this is difficult to experience given the partial vacuum that exists in the feces chamber which ensures that any smells are exhausted to the out of doors so again as long as you Stay up on the on the removal of the urine, uh, or and or the system is designed with it with a with an odor trap. Uh, these toilets are are odor free, and since they utilize the same ventilation technology that I referred to in the composting toilet section, um, there's added benefits like uh, ventilating your bathroom, etc. Some features common to all urine diverting toilets are a toilet seat, at least in Western style designs. A partition bowl uh, or some allowance for the separation of urine from feces, a removable container uh, for the storage of urine, uh, or a drain that leads to a soakway, as I discussed before. Chamber or removable container for the storage of feces, a passive or active ventilation system connecting the feces chamber container to the outside world, which, as I've already described, is designed to create a partial vacuum in order to prevent odors in the bathroom, but also in the case of urine diverting dehydration toilet to. Uh, Contribute constant airflow to assist in drying or dehydrating the feces, which uh, I should point out, by the way, uh, feces is 80% water. So when you remove the water, uh, which um, urine diversion dehydration toilets are very effective at doing, you end up with uh, only 20% of what you started with. So uh, I feel like this that you see in this image can be used for uh, months before it needs to, or needs to be uh, emptied. Uh, and lastly, of course, a uh, structure of some kind that conceals the internals of the toilet from view. Um, some other features may include a mechanically operated trap door for covering the feces chamber or container in between uses, which in this image you can see. You, uh, if you'll notice, you can't see into the compost or into the, the uh, feces chamber because that trap door, which in this case is spring loaded and mechanically operated, that's closed presently. If you need to, uh, you know, go number two, in this toilet, you just simply uh, rotate a lever, which you can actually see uh, on the left-hand side of the toilet, uh, the right side of the image looking at it. Um, you rotate that, the trap door opens, and uh, you do, do your business. And then when you're done, you just rotate the, the trap door back in the closed position, and that's uh, concealed from view. Uh, there's also 
uh, in particularly in the in the mass produced versions, there's some allowance for stirring or turning the contents of the of the feces chamber or the container with the with the drying process. And this is a this uh, image you're seeing now is an example of a toilet that does utilize this. This is a toilet that's just been taken out of a box, so it's obviously it's not hooked up, and all the various parts aren't installed. But we're we're at uh, showing it in use. There's a a, a uh, mechanical manner in which that you can uh, rotate. Basically, an agitator that's inside the uh, the composting or the, the feces chamber, and you rotate that uh, after each use. And not only does that immediately eliminate any smell associated with the feces that was just deposited in the in the feces chamber, but um, it greatly aids in the drying process. And these tip toilets are just like composting toilets are typically used with uh, with some sort of cover material. Um, you know, peat moss is the is the suggested. Uh, Cover crop or cover material for for this particular make and model of toilet, but you know you can use dried leaves, you can use sawdust, you can use uh, pretty much any brown, you know, dead uh, plant matter, uh, and even soil. Some people just use regular old soil. Basically, what you're what you're going for in the end product also works great. Um, so here, looking directly at the image, you can see here's the trap door that covers the feces container. You can just make out in the front of the bowl here that there's a, a separate segregated area. That's where urine goes. Sorry, guys, anybody that's a, 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 an upright peer, um, typically change your ways and, and feel like half the population and seat when you urinate or sit when you urinate. Um, that's what you want to do because you want to prevent urine from going in the feces chamber because, again, you're trying to dry this material out and you're trying to, and you also don't want the, the uh, the chemicals that are in urine getting in here because uh, again is what causes the uh, the odor problems in compost or can cause problems in composting toilets. Um, here you can see the urine, the, urine, the removable urine container, um, and the lever for opening and closing that trap door. This little uh, outlet here is um, there's another identical one on the other side of the toilet. Uh, that's where you connect your ventilation system. There's a, a fan. Typically, fans for these systems um, are not. Uh, Typically nowadays, but not necessarily moving moving forward, are powered by solar, small solar panels, or if the house is uh, equipped with a solar system, a solar solar voltaic system, uh, just tied into that system, so they can be DC powered, or or they can be uh, powered uh, off of mains voltage um, and AC power. See uh, easy to clean, smooth plastic surfaces and surfaces on this uh, example. Um, that's something that's taken into account usually in, in most of these designs, uh, whether they're mass produced or built at home. Um, you know, you want to have a surface that's easy to clean. And again, some of the examples of cover materials that are uh, used after each use. And although, uh, just like their composting toilet relatives, urine diversion dehydration toilets, which are also referred to in, in short as UDDTs, kind of hard to say. It's actually easier to say urine diversion dehydration toilet, <laughs> tend to fall into one of two major categories, uh, those that are remote and those are self-contained. Um, however, uh, there's no need for me to detail the specific differences, uh, as they should now be self-evident. It's pretty much the same concept as you saw before, composting toilet, same idea. So I don't need to go into that. Uh, keep in mind that uh, with both com both composting toilets and your diversion toilets, although they're not matter isn't currently um, explicitly mentioned in current state law, current state law permits the byproducts of these toilets to be buried. However, uh, the only land this can be accomplished on, unfortunately, is land known to meet the requirements for a leach field. Uh, we would like to see this requirement eased in the final version of H375. Um, many states uh, make no uh, mention or that uh, the material be buried on a, on a piece of land that, that perks. We think that's uh, that's uh, in the real world is uh, overly restrictive, and we'd like to see that uh, eliminated entirely um, in most instances. Obviously, if there's an issue, particular property that has a very high water table, uh, which I suppose there's examples of in the state, um, A, you probably don't want to be building there in the first place, but B, you certainly don't want to be burying um, Composted, you know, fresh raw feces uh, or urine, for that matter, because you're you're going to contribute to um, you know the pollution problems that we're already facing with with uh, 
atrium pollution. However, again, in most cases, that's you know not not really a concern. And we'd we'd like the legislation to to address that as well. Um, so, with any luck, uh, in future hearings, um, you will hear more about specific projects underway in Vermont that I've alluded to somewhat, uh, and also in nearby neighboring Massachusetts related to these technologies. Uh, specifically, you're going to hear from the Brattleboro Rich Earth Institute, uh, and it's first of its kind in the U.S. Urine Recycling Study. If you haven't heard about these folks already. Uh, you're in for a treat. This is an amazing project that's underway. They're looking at the feasibility of using uh, urine as uh, fertilizer in agricultural uh, uh, arenas. Uh, you're going to hear from uh, the Green Mountain Club, as I alluded to earlier, uh, and their uh, multiple decades long history of utilizing site built composting toilets in the backcountry of Vermont, uh, as well as elsewhere. They pretty much wrote the book on backcountry sanitation. Uh, that they're, what they've um, been able to do here uh, has been duplicated all over the country and uh, in other parts of the world. A really great story. You're going to hear from the Vermont Law School, hopefully, um, and their experience with their installation of remote composting toilets. You'll hear from the Cobb Hill Cohazen Group, which is down in Heartland, and their experience with the installation of remote composting toilets. And then uh, you'll also um, be lucky enough to hear a, 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 uh, an individual speak to the Cape Cod community of Falmouth's experience with its innovative eco toilet pilot project that I referred to earlier. That is another great project to, to look to or look towards uh, moving ahead. All right, so that that ends part two of my, uh, my testimony. Um, again, I appreciate you uh, and get back to the image of me. Uh, so uh, again, look forward to part three. I will post the link to that, actually to the first part and the part three uh, in the notes section of the YouTube video. Uh, you can navigate to that video at your leisure. Um, uh, I, think, I don't think I've said so, but if, you have any, if anyone has any questions at any point during any of these presentations, uh, they should feel free to contact me directly. Uh, I will also be available um, today that these presentations are shown to the video. I'll be available. Um, via uh, Skype in to answer any questions at that time as well. So again, thank you and uh, look forward